Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Now you may be looking at me today and saying to yourself, huh, Jordan, why don't you look like your normal pale ghost of a self? Uh, well, actually, as you can see, I look like a burnt sweet potato. Instead, I went to a baseball game this past weekend, that's right, like a full four days ago, and uh, did not apply sun tan lotion, or at least I didn't apply enough of it. So, unfortunately, now I look red, and uh, you know, you can make fun of me in the comments, and uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do some systems design. All right, let's go ahead and get into things. So today we're going to be covering a bidding platform. Now at first I was originally tempted to call this video like eBay or something like that, but to tell you the truth, uh, it's a little bit different. The reason being that for starters, we're gonna have slightly different bidding rules than eBay has in the sense that eBay you can like submit a maximum bid and leave things at that. And number two is that this problem is going to attempt to build for scale that eBay realistically probably doesn't have. At the end of the day, uh, I've definitely seen some popular auctions on eBay, but I don't think that any of them are getting like 100 bids within a second, and uh, especially getting that type of throughput the entire time. So to be honest, uh, if we were building eBay, I imagine they probably just use a database, everyone writes to a database, and then the database does some sort of locking, and then they use that to decide who wins. Um, that being said, for our purposes, we're gonna add a couple of extra challenges to this and uh, you know, make it into a far more complicated problem than it needs to be in typical JHNL style. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. So our bidding platform, it's going to be very similar to eBay like I mentioned, but we're just gonna imagine there's a lot more scale uh, than we might have needed. So Jordan's Dirty dim Gym Socks, these are a hot commodity for sure. As you can see, their current bid is $200. A lot of people who wanna pay for those. 752 total bids. Uh, Karinikov is the highest bidder, that makes sense, she loves me. And it ends tomorrow at 4 p.m. And here's a photo of my item. As you can see, they're quite stinky, hence why everyone wants them. So let's formalize some problem requirements. So number one is basically that users are going to be able to bid on certain items. There are gonna be many active bids or auctions open at a time and users can place bids on them. Obviously the highest bid at the end of the auction period is going to be the winner. And auctions can basically have a fixed end time, so the auction gets declared with some sort of fixed end time, or a variable end time that depends on the time of the last bid. So maybe just to you know stay fair, if someone bids with one second left, it doesn't just end right after that. Uh, the time of the ending of the auction now gets bumped forward by 10 minutes or something based on the time that bid was submitted. Cool, number three is that users who care about this auction or maybe have the page for the auction open in their browser will actually get price updates in real time. Number four is that we're able to support a bunch of incoming bids per second from different users for popular items. Now this is the type of scale that I'm truly not sure if eBay realistically has anything like this. And even if they did, it's possible that we could handle them in a slightly different way than normal that would make our lives easier. However, ultimately for this type of video, I wanted to try and take some inspiration from the stock exchange video that we just did while it was fresh in my head and uh, you know, kind of use some of the things that we learned there to apply it to this video as well. Cool. So let's first start by going over the data models. Uh, just because I was thinking about this one, I was using a lot of terms that uh, I think it would be better if we explicitly defined. So we've got our bid, right? A bid has an ID. We have an ID for a specific auction. We have an ID for the user that submitted the bid, a price on the bid, a server-side timestamp, because we don't want to be assigning them from clients, otherwise clients could mess with that. It could mess things up quite a bit. And then we also have a status. So a bid, in my opinion, could be accepted which means it's now the current highest at the time of being submitted, or it can be rejected, meaning that it is too low at the time of being submitted, and even though we're gonna take it down as you having submitted it, sorry, you just didn't bid enough uh, money, and as a result, we're never gonna count this thing. Cool. Another thing to note is that we think it'll be pretty important to basically have all the bids for a given auction available for auditing purposes. Uh, sometimes someone is supposed to pay for an item and they back out and never do and then you want to give it to the second highest bidder. So it's not enough to just store that final state of the auction and who won and the username. Uh, we probably want a trail of all bids, especially in case, I don't know, we ever get investigated or something like that. It's important to have this type of thing. Additionally, uh, this just means that we probably want all of those bids stored in some sort of time series database when this is all said and done. We can shard that by our auction ID because we just want to access all the bids for one given auction ID at a time, probably sorted by their timestamp. Cool. Another data model that we care about is the auction state. So this is pretty simple, but basically it's just going to be some sort of auction ID. We have the current bid ID, so the current winning bid. If I bid $100 and that's the highest one, that would be my ID. 
the $100 price and then the end time of the auction because especially for variable time auctions, uh, that end time will actually switch based on the bid that's currently winning. Cool, so another thing to note is that this is currently only 32 bytes. If we don't expand this data model, it's not a lot of storage. And so it means that if we wanted to do some bidding logic in memory, it wouldn't be too expensive of a model to have. We probably wouldn't have to maintain that many servers. Even if we had a billion auctions, that would still only be 32 gigabytes of data that we had to store. And so yeah, maybe we'd be bound by something like networking speed instead, but at least from a storage perspective, you know, perhaps we could get away with just using a couple in-memory servers here to do a bunch of our auction logic. So let's go into more of the philosophy of the problem. So basically, like I mentioned, I'm going to try and derive a lot of uh, my inspiration for this problem from the one that I did about the exchange. So the truth is, I've done a decent amount of research on trying to build a bidding platform, and I didn't really find any great resources. What I did find, I didn't think was particularly good, and I want to try and dig deep into some of the edge cases or you know, uh, basically race conditions that we can have here, as we did in the exchange video, to see how we can learn from that one in particular. So. Kind of the main thing to note is when we have a bidding system like this, you can have two people who without knowing about one another's bids, meaning their concurrent rights, uh, will actually submit a bid for the same price. And so in that case, who wins? Well, if we were to use something like a multi-leader or a leaderless database, um, you know, we could basically arbitrarily choose one of those bids uh, as a winner and then go back to the user after a little bit and say, hey, okay, your bid is actually on top. Now that is a possible solution, but one kind of premise that I wanted to try and enforce throughout the duration of this video uh, is that when a user submits the bid, um, they will know synchronously whether it was accepted or rejected. Now if I relax this uh, premise, then this becomes a much easier problem, and I'll display that in the next step or the next slide. But when you actually have the premise of saying, okay, whatever the user does, when they submit a bid, they need to synchronously know uh, whether or not theirs went through, this makes things more challenging because now every uh, order, ha uh, basically every operation or every bid has to be totally ordered. And in order to totally order something, we need to do that through basically one single choke point. Now it is true that we can provide a total ordering of operations over multiple different nodes if we were to use something like Lamport clocks, but then that leaves a lot of basically arbitrary room where uh, you know one node basically takes precedence over another when there are uh, potentially two concurrent rights, and then that wouldn't be fair per se. So I guess you know it's not the exchange, right? We don't really care, but if we do want to try and maintain a fair bidding platform where it's actually, if I bid first and we bid the same price, I win, then something like a multi-leader or leaderless replication setup isn't going to work for us. We should probably have something where all of our rights are ordered by some single leader. And so that means that whenever we have a single leader or a single choke point to help us order all of our bids to decide which ones are winning and the actual order of operations that happened, we need to ensure that we're getting a good amount of write throughput, otherwise we're going to be in trouble. So at least as far as I'm aware, one of the highest ways of achieving high write throughput uh, and ordering all the events in doing so is by putting everything in Kafka. So we can do this and basically, you know, because it, Kafka is effectively a log-based message broker, uh, everything is inherently ordered by the log and the sequence number in which it reaches Kafka. So for example, if we have user A and user B over here and they're both submitting conflicting bids, one of them is going to reach this Kafka queue first and as a result, that one is going to be the winner of the auction. And then over here, you know, we've got some additional logic where at its own pace, it can pull from the Kafka queue and determine if the bid is accepted or rejected. Now the nice thing about Kafka is it can achieve really high write throughput. Uh, this is as a result of, you know, we're writing directly to a log, so we have all sequential writes. And also Kafka uses basically this kernel bypass or zero copy mechanism to ensure that when data comes in to the network card, it doesn't have to be copied into user space. Uh, which is like a, a whole operating system thing to be viewed. Um, and so as a result, again, it can achieve very high write throughput, which is great. And then on the logic side, we can kind of read these events as slowly as we want. And basically the order that they come in from Kafka is how they're ordered. So the bad part of this, at least as, as far as I can tell, is that there's basically no guarantee uh, when a user is gonna hear back whether or not their bid was accepted or rejected, right? It'll happen eventually. 
uh, but eventually might not be good enough. They want to know within the duration of their HTTP request whether something was accepted or rejected. So again, if I were to relax this constraint and say, hey, you know, you'll, you'll just listen to some topic down the line and hear about it, that would make this problem a lot easier because then this Kafka solution becomes feasible. Kafka, um, you know, would give us fault tolerance and basically allow us to ensure that once a message is in there, it's probably good to go. And at the end of the day, uh, then every single uh, consumer would basically listen to the same topic. And when a user submits a bid, maybe they have to wait five seconds, but eventually they would see that they're winning. I don't think that's a good user experience. And so I'm going to try and do something with a synchronous endpoint. And that, of course, is going to cause us a lot of complications, hence the length of this video. Cool. So again, like I mentioned, we want bids that are synchronous, right? When I submit a bid over here, I want to basically go to the server and hear about it. And so this server that I'm going to create, I'm going to dub the bid engine. So the bid engine is going to be very similar to the matching engine from our exchange video. But the gist is really this is going to store that auction state and it's going to accept every incoming bid from any possible source and tell you whether it's a valid or an invalid one because the price is either not high enough or maybe it's out of the active time range of the auction. But the gist is, we want this guy to now be doing all of our bidding logic for us, and it's now a central choke point. So since we're not buffering anything in Kafka, we need the throughput of this bid engine to be very high. So it's going to have to be able to handle all of those incoming requests. And that means we're also just going to have to be smart in terms of how we deal with the concurrency here, right? Because if you have multiple bids coming from multiple sources at the same time, you're probably going to have to perform some locking on the bid engine to keep everything looking good. Now, fortunately, we mentioned that the amount of state that's actually required uh, for an auction is pretty small, right? It only takes like 32 bytes to store the current state of the auction, which is really just current bid price, uh, who's winning, and what time it ends. So because of that, we can actually just keep this whole thing in memory. We started to discuss that before. It would not be a lot of memory in order to keep the state of all of the auctions there. So again, what would be great is to keep this thing as fast as possible. Not only do we keep all this stuff in memory, but ideally we don't want to do any disk reads in the critical path of deciding whether a bid is valid or invalid. And ideally we also wouldn't want to do any network calls in the critical path of deciding a bid is valid or invalid. And that is going to allow us to uh, basically achieve the maximum throughput on our bidding engine. Cool. So basically, as every single request comes in, we're just going to have that request lock, grab a lock on the auction state, check if the bid is valid, and then you know if it is, that's great, return that to the user. Uh, and if it's not, return that to the user too, but then we can proceed. So really, we're just locking that auction state for a second, checking if the price of the incoming bid is sufficiently high, and then moving on. Cool, so another thing is you know, if one particular bidding engine is getting a ton of traffic, because you know, it's responsible for hosting the bids of all auctions, we can just go ahead and partition it out. All that really matters is that all the bids with the same auction ID are being sent to the same server or the same bidding engine. So that means that we can do some sort of consistent hashing on the auction ID. So you're now starting to hear, okay, well, you know, we've got this engine that's trying to maintain really high throughput. <clears throat> and everything that it's doing is completely in memory. Not only are we not syncing things to disk, but at least up to this point, we don't have any replicas of it. So how can we achieve fault tolerance? Well, the way that we would typically achieve some amount of fault tolerance in a situation like this is adding a backup. So we did something very similar in our exchange video, but the general idea here is, um, you know, if we have a backup and we have a primary bidding engine, if we're sending our bids from the user, both to the primary and the backup, and another user is also sending them to the primary and the backup at the same time, those two nodes may actually disagree on the order of the bids. So one option to fix this is you know, to have some sort of middleman that uses distributed consensus to order all of those writes, or you know, to have Kafka in there. But we already mentioned that we don't want to have Kafka as a source for the bidding engine, because then everything becomes asynchronous for doing stream processing, and it's going to be hard uh, to give our user a synchronous response back. So using Kafka in the middle is not a feasible answer. What we should do instead is the same thing as the exchange video, which is going to be state machine replication, meaning the backup is going to basically listen to the output from the primary. So let's go ahead and demonstrate that. So let's say I have a user right over here. I have another user right over here. They're both writing bids to some bid gateway. And you can see they're arriving at the primary bid engine over here. The primary bid engine might receive those at the same time, but because of the locking that we're going to use, 
we're going to establish a total ordering over all the bids. Then once we do that, we can send those bids synchronously over to our backup. And so that way the backup is always kept up to date. In fact, if we really wanted to keep things up to date to ensure that this guy doesn't hear about the status of their bid before uh, that bid is propagated to the backup, we can actually make sure that we put the bid on the backup before a user actually hears back from the, bid, uh, from the bidding engine or the primary bidding engine rather. Cool, so that's actually not the only component of this problem. We also want to talk about message delivery to other interested parties, right? So besides the backup uh, bidding engine that actually cares about the state of the primary bidding engine, we also have this kind of audit database where we want to see the history of all submitted bids. We also have other users that are just looking at this auction and looking at how the price is changing over time. And so rather than having our primary bidding engine uh, send this message to all of those places at once, uh, because that is going to put a significant amount of load on it, instead, why don't we actually just uh, you know, export those bids to Kafka, and then from there, everyone else who's interested in them can handle them accordingly. So we're basically going to put these in Kafka so that multiple consumers can go ahead and read down the list. And the nice thing about Kafka is that it's fault tolerant. Now, of course, depending on the configuration of Kafka that you're using, uh, you're going to have differing degrees of fault tolerance. You can do some amount of synchronous replication. Uh, you can send the message to multiple Kafka queues. You can have Kafka do only asynchronous replication. And of course, all of this is going to impact your write speeds as well as the fault tolerance of all your messages. So we can discuss that a little bit more, or at least uh, the pros and cons of some replication configuration. But you know, start to think about it. If we want to make sure that we're never losing a bid from our primary matching engine, well, that means that we also have to be able to never lose it from Kafka uh, because we're first sending it to Kafka before we tell a user the status of their bid. So what does our flow look like now? Basically, we've got our bid service over here. We've got a user that wants to submit a bid. We've got our bid engine, so that's gonna be the primary. So the first thing that happens is a user submits a bid, says, hey, for Jordan's socks, I'm gonna uh, send $200. The bid service is gonna forward that over to the bid engine. The bid engine is then gonna say, okay, well, before I tell this guy whether or not his bid is now the winner, I have to make sure to put this thing in Kafka so that everyone else knows about it. And in that sense, it's possible that this guy can go into Kafka and the bid engine could even go down before this guy hears whether his bid is valid or not. At the end of the day, what that really means is that Kafka is actually going to be the source of truth of our system. Once a bid is completely persisted in Kafka and replicated and fault tolerant, then that basically means that it is real, right? This guy might not hear back on an HTTP request, but he will eventually hear back from any of the downstream sources because at the end of the day, he's gonna be on that page too and he's still gonna be connected, listening for real-time updates to the price. Eventually, he will see that he is actually the bidder, uh, but his HTTP request might fail for whatever reason. So putting things in Kafka first basically allows us to say, okay, everyone else in the rest of the system, whether it's the audit consumers, whether it's our backup matching engine or our bidding engine, or whether it's just all the servers that are then going to forward price updates to all the clients, they're all going to agree on the ordering because it has been decided first by that primary bid engine, but ultimately Kafka is the source of truth. Cool, so we published to Kafka before telling the user if their bid was accepted. Again, this is going to prevent the bid engine from failing before data gets published to Kafka, right? Our alternative option is the bid engine, you know, processes a bid, says, okay, this is valid, let me go ahead and tell the user that. So that's nice. However, what could then happen is it then fails once again before anything gets into Kafka, and now that bid is not fault tolerant, right? So it's not in the backup, so then the bid engine goes down, this guy thinks he had a successful bid, it's not true, the rest of the system doesn't know about it, and now he's gonna be very confused and very angry, and we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. So that's another situation that we do wanna try and avoid where possible, is basically this guy thinking that he submitted a successful bid, except no one else knows about it, and if no one else knows about it, and the primary engine goes down, that bid is effectively overwritten, right? It will get overwritten, no one is aware that that bid has ever existed. Cool, so of course, we still have risk of bids getting lost if Kafka goes down. Even once this step three happens and that bid is in Kafka, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single node in the system is going to eventually be aware of it. It is possible that you know we hit our single leader in Kafka and that single leader goes down before it can replicate things. But again, that's why I say it depends on our replication topology of Kafka that we're using. Maybe instead of just publishing to one broker, we actually publish to two, bro two brokers 
before we uh, consider that operation done and send uh, status back to the user. But uh, you know there are pros and cons to all these approaches. It's obviously going to take a lot longer to process bids if we publish to more places. So keep that in mind. So a question is, you know, if we're publishing to Kafka now, how can we actually keep our bid engine throughput as high as possible? Because now we're introducing an extra network call, which needs to happen um, in order to return any data back to our client on that synchronous API call. So this is where I'm going to try and get into some pseudocode for the bid engine. So basically, I'm going to present two versions. One of them is going to have faster bids. So faster bids basically means we're going to return some data back to our client a little bit faster. So in this case, you know, the first thing that we're going to do is you know, we get some bid on our bid engine with an auction ID, a bid, and a price. So we want to get the auction state accordingly. That's just going to live in some hash map, and we'll, we'll get the, the reference to that object. We're going to grab a lock on it. So now we're in the critical path, right? In order to keep our bidding engine throughput as high as possible, we want to do as, minimum, uh, as low an amount of work in this critical piece of code as possible. So all we're really going to do is say, OK, well, get me the next sequence number uh, of this bid. So maybe there have been 100 bids. This is clearly the 101st attempt. Then we're going to see if our bid is accepted, which is basically if our price on the bid is higher than the current price on the auction, and also if our time is less than the end time of the auction. And then finally, if our bid has been accepted, meaning the price was higher, then we can go ahead and basically set the price of the auction to equal the price of the bid. So we've updated our auction state. We've read it as much as we need to. Now we can exit the critical section of our code. It's really just three operations and move on with our life. So our option here now is what we can do is basically we can upload our bid to Kafka, as we mentioned we would do, bid, sequence number of it, and then whether or not it was accepted. And then basically we're just going to return that accepted value to the user, whether or not it was a valid bid. So a couple of things. Uh, for starters, note that uh, the I.O. piece is not actually in the critical section. right? And because the, the I.O. to Kafka is not in the critical section, this means that our bid engine can still handle tons of bids at once because uh, you know all the contention is just in this locking section over here. And uh, it means that we could technically now afford to do a, a more expensive type of uh, replication in Kafka, like a synchronous replication that's going to help us ensure that bids don't get lost once they get published to Kafka. However, there is a different race condition here, which is this guy. Because multiple bids can be processed at the same time, it's possible that, you know, say our bid with sequence number six might get to Kafka before a bid with sequence number five, because we're not doing any locking to ensure the ordering that we're publishing to Kafka. Now, the nice thing about that is even though uh, the sequence number six bid might get to Kafka before sequence number five, we still have sequence numbers in general. And so all of our downstream consumers can use those sequence numbers to make sure that they're processing all the messages in order. If they see a sequence number X, they just don't process it until they first get the message for X minus one, and so on. However, the problem is, basically, let's say, you know, I send sequence number six to Kafka, and sequence number five hasn't yet been sent, but then our bidding engine goes down and five never gets sent. The problem now is I've returned accepted to the user. The user thinks that they sent a valid bid, and they did, but uh, no one downstream is going to process that because they never saw the bid with sequence number five, and now they're saying, well, shoot, you know what, I have no clue what's actually going on there. Uh, I don't know if this is valid or not. So uh, yeah, there's basically going to be a case of a lost bid. So how can we avoid that? Basically, in this case, what we would want to do is ensure that when we publish to Kafka, we're publishing the bids in their proper order. So that Kafka's order is actually reflecting the legitimate order that the bids were processed in uh, by the bidding engine. So this time, everything's going to look very similar, except uh, you know we have some auction state right here. Um, and then what we're going to do is say, OK, well, eventually, I know that this thing is going to be uploaded to Kafka, this bid. So when it happens, just return uh, the accepted value that we're uploading to Kafka back to our user. So we're basically registering a callback function on when we eventually upload to Kafka. Cool. Then in the critical section of the code, which again, we want to keep as fast as possible, we're doing the same exact thing where we get the sequence number of the bid, we get whether it's accepted, we update the current price of the auction. And then the last thing that we're going to do 
is basically access some queue, some concurrent queue, and say, hey, I'm gonna call this current concurrent queue to Kafka, and at the end of it, we're gonna put our bid, the sequence number of that bid, and whether or not it was accepted. So now we have this internal in-memory queue on our bidding engine that is not necessarily going to be directly uploaded to Kafka right now, but it is going to enqueue all of our bids in their correct order. Then in the background, we can actually have another thread that pulls from that queue every once in a while and uploads to Kafka accordingly. So we do that on another thread in the background. Then on our actual like um, you know handle bid function that we call when an incoming bid happens, we'll basically wait, hoping our handler gets called. If it doesn't, we're eventually just gonna throw an error and return that to the user. But the gist is, what we're now ensuring is that all bids are going to be uploaded in their proper order to Kafka. And as a result of that, it is possible that say, you know, this to Kafka piece never actually ends up getting uploaded to Kafka because of the fact that, um, because of the fact that, you know, the bidding engine can go down. But even if the bidding engine does go down, uh, we're only basically going to return the value of accepted to the user once it's been properly uploaded to Kafka. So we shouldn't have any errors in this case uh, where we tell a user like, hey, you know, you sent some sort of bid, uh, but it's since been lost and we have no clue what it is. Uh, it is possible, again, still, this is not perfect because Kafka can go down, but uh, depending on the replication method that we use, we can get really, really, really close to perfect here without using any sort of distributed consensus, which is very nice. Cool. Uh, one of the other pieces of this puzzle is going to be uh, the consumers of bids. So like I mentioned, we want to create some sort of audit log or time series database of all the bids. So really, you know, we have this Kafka queue that comes from our bidding engine that takes in all the bids. Uh, we have some sort of consumer. We're going to sync to a time series database, simple enough, shard by auction ID. Number two is we also want to be communicating the current price to our users. So one approach of doing this is to have these user servers, which again, reading from that same bids Kafka queue, we have some sort of stateful consumer, which is you know, going to be aggregating the auction state so that it can see the highest current price. And then uh, you know, it'll use server sent events to send these over to a user. Uh, the users themselves will know which server to connect to because we can have a load balancer once again, uh, using some sort of service discovery or mapping that tells us, you know, for a given auction ID, which server you should start listening to for their server sent events. Now, it's worth noting that there can be popular auctions, right? Um, you know, maybe this is less so the case in eBay, but in our fictional bidding service, it's possible that, you know, you could have a million people who are really interested in the price of a given auction or just watching that price go, go up at a time. So uh, for popular auctions, not only are we going to have a lot of people who want to get the price updates, but there are also probably, and this is going to be correlated, a lot of bids. So the gist is, um, you know, we can have multiple servers that are listening to this data or consuming it for the bid data. And additionally, for all of these servers to kind of lessen the load on them, they don't actually need to know every single bid that was submitted for a given auction. They just need to know the current highest price for the auction. So they don't care about all the rejected bids. They only care about the accepted ones. So how can we do that? Well, we have our bid engine right here, as we discussed before. That publishes to Kafka. We have our backup engine that listens to those things. And then perhaps the backup engine or another consumer on the bids Kafka queue can basically look at all the bids and only put the accepted ones in the new top bid Kafka queue. And then now we have all of these user facing servers that are listening to this Kafka queue. So it's going to be a significantly fewer amount of updates if there are a ton of erroneous bids coming to our popular auction. And then based on uh, you know some round robin load balancing scheme, we can connect all of our users to one of them and have some sort of WebSocket or server sent events forwarding them the updates. Cool, I'm gonna finally put a little bit of thought into the actual auction ending mechanism because I'm sure someone will get mad at me otherwise because I did say this as a functional requirement. So basically um, for the fixed time auctions, obviously we're gonna have a fixed end timestamp. Uh, for the variable time auctions, basically as bids come in and are accepted, so this is saying in the bidding engine, uh, we can update that finishing time based on the timestamp that is assigned to the bid. Cool, so then uh, the gist is here, uh, the bid engine will basically typo. The bid engine will basically occasionally check the time, uh, you know, that it is right now versus the end auction time, and if we've crossed it, 
basically what we do is we can go ahead and write to an auction database with the winning bid ID. So one thing to note is uh, if this winning bid ID is not necessarily yet in Kafka, what could then happen is you know we put the winning bid ID in some sort of database uh, and then our bidding engine goes down except that bid is not fault tolerant just yet and as a result uh, now we basically put a fake bid as the winning one in the database. So that would be bad. So the bidding engine should basically wait for that particular bid ID to be uploaded to Kafka, aka not present uh, in the like to upload queue that we have locally. Cool. And then as far as any derived data goes, because eventually we'll probably want to show a user uh, all the auctions that they won, uh, basically take that auction database, uh, do some sort of change data capture on it, put it in Kafka, shard that by the user ID of the associated winning bid, and then you can you know do a bunch of stuff from there. But uh, just as, yeah, let's just use change data capture. That's really all I'm gonna say for now because I don't really wanna get into all the semantics of like, how are we gonna notify a user that their bid won? Um, it, it's not too hard as long as we're doing something like this. Cool, and by using derived data, then we don't have to work, uh, worry about a bunch of uh, failure scenarios as well, which is very nice. Very nice, uh, let's see. And then of course, once our winning bid is in the auctions database, um, our server, which was holding the auction state, can go ahead and clean that up accordingly uh, because we no longer need it. The auction is finally complete. So I guess the last piece of this puzzle is of course going to be uh, wrapping everything together as we've covered thus far. And so basically, we're gonna go ahead and start from our client as per usual. So the client is going to be able to do two things. The first is that it's going to be able to submit a bid. So when it does, it hits some random load balancer, which round robins it onto some bid gateway. So this is just a server that's going to route requests over to our bid engine. So the bid engine, like we mentioned, is sharded effectively per auction ID and is going to handle all of the logic for determining uh, the ordering of the incoming bids. So in order to keep everything fault tolerant with our bid engine, we basically wanna make sure to materialize that bid in Kafka first before returning any status back to the client. The reason being that ideally, we don't want it to be the case that the client is always hearing, oh, hey, you had a successful bid, and then it turns out that the bid engine goes down and it didn't actually. So we do want to keep the throughput on the bid engine as high as humanly possible, while also ensuring that we have uh, good correctness guarantees for our system. So again, the way that we do that is basically syncing it to Kafka and using derived data. One example of derived data would be the backup engine, where the backup engine is listening to the ordering that the primary bid engine is, uh, is creating by handling all the bid events one at a time. And then it's also connected to Zookeeper as is the primary so that in the event the primary goes down, we can perform failover over to the backup engine and then every other system, including the bid gateways, are aware that they should now be reaching out to the backup engine. Additionally, another piece of uh, hardware that's going to be listening to the Kafka uh, queue is going to be our stream consumers. So these are going to do a couple of things. For starters, they're going to sync all of those bids to time series databases. This is so that we can audit them later, or if someone backs out of uh, you know, their winning bid, we can go to the next highest guy. Another thing is that we also basically in these stream consumers want to filter down the incoming bids, look at only the ones that are valid, so those that actually bumped up the price of the auction, and put those into some second queue called the auction state queue. The reason we have this queue is because it's a much more filtered down version or condensed version of the auction if there's a lot of concurrency, and that way we can have all of our auction state servers listening to that just cache the highest price uh, for a particular auction. And then as a result, when a client wants to get real-time updates for a given auction, they hit some sort of load balancer. The load balancer is gonna say, okay, well, I can connect you to this particular server over here because it has the auction state of the auction you care about. Or if perhaps it's a particular popu uh, particularly popular one, maybe both of these guys have that state. And then the load balancer, besides uh, just figuring out that both of those servers are valid, does an additional round robin component to all of this to just randomly select one for you. From there, you can then subscribe to server sent events since this is just going to be a one-way real-time communication from server to client. And hopefully from there, we are good to go. Well guys, let me know if you enjoyed this video. I understand it's probably not the most practical one and I imagine that in practice, someone like eBay is probably just going server, database, establish a lock. 
Um, but I do think it's still a cool system overall. So uh, let me know what you think. Um, I wasn't able to find any great eBay uh, systems design resources online. And so uh, I hope to at least slightly be a trailblazer in this field, but we'll have to see once I hear from you guys. Anyways, have a great week.